So thank you again once again for giving us the very high honor of coming to the ICD Academy for Cultural Diplomacy for your excellent keynote address and for agreeing to, to spend a few more moments with us to go into some issues that are I think very important for the students and faculty of the Academy and actually for the world. Uh, if I may, I'd like to, to begin by asking you about perhaps one of the biggest challenges, uh, not only facing Europe but actually the world right now, the, the current challenge with Ukraine and Russia. Uh, as I was saying, I had a conversation with a few of the speakers yesterday where some were basically saying in the current situation of war, cultural diplomacy, soft power, forget about it. Uh, the only answer is militarily. The only answer is to continue fighting. And I'd love to get your opinion. You know, as you see a, a challenge so, as complex as Ukraine, Russia, uh, is there a space for cultural diplomacy? Uh, if not, how do we end this? Uh, what circumstance might, could we imagine in which there is peace between Ukraine and Russia? Now, what I would say is that uh, um, conditions for cultural di diplomacy are not favorable in the context of war. I think that, that we will uh, can agree. Um, but um, peace and uh, the reconciliation process, and I hope there will be one uh, sooner than later, um, will... Um, uh, build on the, also the cultural relationship. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is true that uh, uh, between the, the Russian people and Ukraine, these ties are close. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, in the context of war, uh, it, it is not so easy to identify um, uh, initiatives uh, of cultural diplomacy that are really viable, mm -hmm. uh, but we should not lose that ambition. Mm -hmm. And um, perhaps uh, uh, in sports, for instance, mm -hmm. um, we should try to maintain at least some uh, channels of uh, communication um, that would be uh, important for the future. So uh, not favorable, mm -hmm. uh, we can agree with that, but uh, we should um, uh, bear in mind that uh, this would be the desired thing to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then just to the second part of my question, again, there's no easy answer for this, but what kind of a solution could you envision? Uh, how, you know, someone with your experience from the point of view of the European Parliament, how might this, this come to a peaceful ending, Ukraine, Russia? Well, we um, could say Russia against the West is another question. Well, at this stage, um, I don't think it is possible to foresee the uh, exact terms of a peace scenario. It, it is simply not there. Yeah. So we are in the middle of the war. Um, the situation uh, is uh, in a way blocked in the battlefield. Um, and uh, I believe that both parties are still looking for the best position in order to um, uh, to negotiate a solution for the conflict. But um, uh, the movement uh, that we are seeing both in Ukraine with uh, uh, Western support and uh, uh, in Russia uh, is still um, basically um, uh, in conflict mode. And uh, so I, I don't think it would be uh, um, fair to speculate on the conditions for peace. Uh, one thing we know, because that was always the case in the past, uh, one day uh, we come, will come that uh, to build peace, uh, both parties would have to sit at the table of the negotiations and find a, a workable agreement. What kind of agreement is simply not possible to say at this stage. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Would you like to? Yeah, so I'd like to transition to a slightly different topic, and I'm sure you are asked this all the time, doing what you do, but regarding the European Union, what do you think are our current challenges? And in the last five or 10 years, you know, we keep seeing this sort of Euroscepticism and backlash to pan-European identity or European integration, this like nationalism and stuff. Like how can the EU deal with that? And what are the challenges with the European Union right now? Well, I would say the first challenge from, from them all is to deliver results, results for people, allowing the European project to meet citizens' expectations. Um, uh, after the three major 
crisis that we had, the financial crisis, then the pandemic, and now again, the uh, living cost crisis uh, caused by the uh, war in Ukraine. Of course, we have this content, and it, it becomes easy for the populists and the Eurosceptics to, um, to blame the uh, European project. Um, so, um, an economic recovery uh, in these very difficult conditions uh, is understood to be uh, a priority for the European Union. That's why, after the pandemic, we launched the, um, the recovery uh, plan with uh, uh, substantial financial means. Uh, but uh, then we have this uh, situation with the war, um, risks of uh, recession that were somehow controlled, but rising of uh, interest, interest rates with a restrictive monetary policy. So uh, again, um, a crisis uh, for the condition of the union. Anyhow, um, this has to be always a top priority for the EU. Then I would say that we have to uh, have uh, um, a medium and long-term vision about the major challenges of the European project, and that has to do with uh, the um, uh, energy transition and the digital tra transition. Mm -hmm. And uh, they uh, both, in particular due to climate change, they are um, uh, a major issue for citizens in Europe. So to have uh, uh, substantive uh, investments uh, in order to promote this double transition um, is of course one of the top priorities in the EU. If I can add also the issues related uh, with uh, uh, the way <coughs> the European democracy works. Because people are also uh, unsatisfied with what they perceive as being the uh, democratic deficit in the yeah. European Union. <coughs> we had a long discussion uh, on that for years, but um, uh, it is true that people are asking for more uh, chances of uh, participation in decision-making beyond the, uh, the voting every four or five years. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Mark? Um, sure, I mean, I was just going to ask you a question in a more maybe academic or a broader way regarding culture diplomacy. So let's uh, forget about the first question that I asked you and let's imagine we're in a normal situation, we have peace, we have stability. How would you define culture diplomacy? What is culture diplomacy? Well, I would say that uh, cultural diplomacy is uh, the promotion of uh, um, uh, shared cultural values, but also the respect from, for uh, diversity in terms of those uh, values. Uh, because uh, um, there's no cultural diplomacy if we have um, uh, a totalitarian uh, view of what should be um, uh, each other culture. Um, so uh, this is the fundamental thing. And I think this is important. Um, this has been important inside the European Union. Um, and uh, I would say that uh, for some reason the Erasmus project is being presented as the best example of uh, cultural diplomacy because it is allowing for direct exchanges between people and students um, uh, in many countries of Europe and they are discovering the um, uh, importance of, of this diversity but also the common values that they share. So it, is, it has been uh, important, this cultural diplomacy inside the uh, uh, European project. But it is also important globally, and their global uh, cultural diplomacy is um, nowadays uh, one of the um, topics of the foreign policy, uh, where we, yes, we um, promote uh, relations with countries and peoples all over the world and um, trying to uh, understand each other better and uh, um, also promoting the values of um, human rights and uh, democracy and the rule of law um, and making an effort for those 
that is to become more global okay. uh, in the world. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think part of the reason why I see uh, the European Union has been so successful with programs like Erasmus and beyond is because the focus isn't on influence. Let me tell you about my culture. The focus is exchange. Uh, I still remember I had high level negotiations with the French uh, Ministry of Culture years ago. They wanted to do a new Euro European Young Leaders program. And we were helping to design a number of different formats. And the big debate at the end of it all came down to one question. Uh, should they go with a philosophie d'influence or a philosophie des champs? Uh, mm -hmm. We were, of course, in favor of a philosophy of exchange. In the end, they decided influence. So mm -hmm. instead of doing this, <laughs> they did another German-French Young Leaders program with the idea that the German-French would then influence the others. But I think that's really what the European Union, as an outsider looking in, has yeah. done so well. It's about exchange. It's about facilitating. Go on this Erasmus exchange. Have a good experience. Have a bad experience. That's up to you. Uh, make up your own mind of the country and bring your educations forward. Uh, and this is something useful yeah. also for their careers. And I believe there, uh, there are many more things we can do in, in this respect. I think the EU should invest more in uh, volunteering in, because these sort of programs allow uh, for this exchange to happen uh, in very concrete terms. Um, young people uh, traveling to an, another uh, country, um, uh, experiencing the cultural diversity, but also um, uh, experiencing the values of solidarity and the promoting them where, where they are. So um, I see that there is a huge room for uh, improvement, um, not only with programs similar to the uh, Erasmus program with uh, uh, other countries outside the EU, uh, but uh, also with uh, programs for volunteering. I couldn't agree more. I think if you look at today's society, it seems so much that the focus is always taking. What can I take for me, for my career, for my benefit, for my education? How often is it that young leaders uh, or students or really anyone takes the time to give? to do something with no self-interest, no you know, other agendas, just to give, to help their neighbor, uh, whether it's down the street or a neighboring country, or it, we have to see how we define neighbor. Very, very important, and I think there, Europe, I don't think it has as much experience with that as, for example, the US, uh, where you have a long tradition of civil society engagements because of the deficiency of the government. <laughs> the American <laughs> government does very little for its citizens compared to Europe, where the, the social state, of course, health insurance, benefits, etc., does much more. Uh, but the tradition that I have to help my neighbor, I think is newer. Um, but I I wanted to ask you another question, coming back to cultural diplomacy, and then I'll give it back to you. Um, I was just thinking that's an interesting perspective. My, my question is really, whose job is cultural diplomacy? Uh, if you look at the American approach, the American government traditionally has always said, this is not our business, that's for the private sector. If Hollywood wants to make money and their successor or their movies abroad, let them do it. That's not the job of the government. Uh, France would be the other extreme, where the French government says, this is our job, uh, not only to promote our culture, but to also protect our culture. We're going to put quotas on the radio and limit, forcefully by law how much of a certain language is or is not allowed on our, on our airwaves. So I just see a very different approaches of really mm. controlling, supporting, you know, the government saying it's our job, we should pay to bring French art and to bring French musicians and to bring French poets, you know, to Germany to perform in the Alliance Francaise or Asseu Francaise, Cinema de Paris, here in Berlin, Kerfurst and Dam, which is great on the one hand, you know, giving more opportunities for us to experience French culture, but very different approaches. So my question from the European Parliament point of view, mm -hmm. whose job is this? Is this for the citizens? Should the governments relax? Uh, is it for governments or, or European institutions? Or are there ways in which they can also work hand in hand? H how do you see the, the future of cultural diplomacy? Well, what I would say is that the important thing is not to make of those different uh, approaches as if they were mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is plenty of room for uh, initiatives of the civil society um, in terms of cultural diplomacy, and that's so I'm fine with that, and I think that's valuable uh, and important. Um, but uh, I see cultural diplomacy uh, at the same time as being uh, a public policy, something that uh, um, public policies uh, should uh, invest on. Um, so um, uh, this means political decisions, uh, um, um, political programs, and uh, financial means mm -hmm. and uh, decisions uh, of this kind they are really political decisions so um, 
despite the creativity of the civil society in this respect, which is always uh, important, um, I see that um, we ha sometimes have to do it uh, with the support of um, the, the, the public policies. And uh, is there room for partnership? Of course, when we talk about uh, the, the development of these uh, public uh, um, policies in concrete terms, um, that calls for uh, participation of the civil society, NGOs, you name it, and uh, this um, means that uh, the partnership is uh, one of the instruments of developing these kind of policies. Thank you very much. I will give the microphone back to you. Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, so just for the, the sort of final question here, before he asks you, Mother Tongue, this is in English. Because we have students from all over the world here, you know. We have spoken a lot about the European Union, but some of these students will go back maybe for other regional organizations like ASEAN or the African Union. Like, what advice or message would you give to future young leaders who want to participate in this kind of regional cooperation? Well, what I would say to begin with is that uh, um, it makes sense to know the uh, European project because it is different and uh, uh, important uh, in the world. Um, the European project uh, delivered um, some decades of peace in a continent that was divided by terrible uh, wars. Um, it has promoted uh, the um, uh, conditions of living, the standards, even the environmental standards, mm -hmm. the uh, consumer protection uh, requirements uh, as a few uh, other places in the world. So the European project has put together uh, many different countries speaking different languages and cooperating and uh, this is of uh, utmost importance. Now the European project um, is um, open uh, for the discussion uh, mm -hmm. and the cooperation with uh, um, the players in the world. Uh, what I would say is that uh, none of these global challenges that we face can uh, be met without cooperation. We've learned this inside the European Union and we are addressing those issues um, through the cooperation between European countries, but this is also true globally. Um, uh, so, um, the, um, there is really no alternative. Uh, you know that uh, this expression, there is no alternative, has been sure. used. But uh, if we are talking about the fundamental global challenges in the world, I do believe there is really no alternative to cooperation. Multilateralism, uh, as I say, um, very inspired with uh, the, um, the efforts being made by the current Secretary General of the United, the United Nations, the Portuguese, Absolutely. Antonio Guterres. Uh, I worked with him in the Portuguese government uh, before. Um, so multilateralism is important, but also uh, um, relations, bilateral relations and relations from regions to, to, to regions. And I believe the European Union has a role to play uh, in order to promote uh, a better world and uh, to uh, regular, uh, to uh, have a, a regulatory framework for the globalization, which is important in many domains, but also in promoting these uh, partnerships mm. for mm -hmm. political cooperation. Thank you. We know your time is very precious, so we appreciate you giving us more of your time and being pleasure. here today in Berlin mm. and answering some more questions. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much.